Welcome, everybody, to another one of our EEN's Faith and Agriculture webinars. We're so pleased to have an encore presentation by our good friend, Gabe Brown. Gabe, uh, you have been traveling, I understand, seen some places, been somewhere. Um, why don't you share a little of that before we uh, go into the presentation? Where have you been? Well, uh, thank you, Tim. Great to be with you in EEN once again. I thoroughly enjoy our time together. Uh, yes, been traveling uh, quite a bit. Um, I've uh, been pretty much on the road uh, uh, since February of this year. Uh, been over to the UK, spent some time there. Some exciting things happening there. Uh, I was invited over there because Waitrose, which is a very large, uh, it's kind of like the Whole Foods of the UK, made a commitment and they asked me to come over as they made the announcement that by the year 2035, all of their fresh products sold in their 352 stores uh, will be regeneratively grown and raised. Mm. So that was okay. a huge commitment by a very large company that just really believes that we need to get back and start uh, uh, growing and raising our food as God intended. Mm -hmm. So that was exciting. I I, uh, I was in Ireland just two weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, doing workshops there for farmers. It's our third year in a row that we've worked with farmers uh, there. We've been expanding uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, doing work now in Uruguay and, and uh, Venezuela and several Central and Latin American co countries, uh, Mexico. Now we're also expanding into Sweden, soon to be the Netherlands, Spain, uh, <laughs> a project going on in Africa, pretty large project. So it's exciting for me and our team to really see regenerative agriculture is coming to the forefront all over. But perhaps, Tim, the most exciting thing to me is, is seeing the real change on the land. Mm. And those who have been going down this path, seeing that it's making a difference on their own farm and ranch and in their communities. And that's really exciting for us to see. Yeah, in fact, Gabe, I was talking about uh, and shared with you that yesterday, here in Rock County, we're one of the smallest counties in, in Minnesota, southwest corner. And um, we had uh, Congressman Finstead from Minnesota First District who met with a group of soil health leaders here in Rock County, representing soil water conservation and the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. And uh, Gabe, we heard stories th th that were so impressive. And so many felt it was part of their calling from God to move that direction. That, 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 was, that was a clarion call on their lives. And so many sacrificed up front, just as you gave. Um, I, was, I was teasing you that here, here this North Dakota boy who got hailed out and, and drowned out and had drought. And, and here you are visiting the world, telling the story of regenerative agriculture and, and truly a, a calling. Mm -hmm. um, as we move into the presentation, let's just take a moment just to just to be quiet and, and to invite God's spirit to enter into our time together. Let us pray. Lord, you do remarkable things. You continue to surprise us in everything. You surprise us with your calling of people calling us into a connection with you through the land. You remind us that the land was there in the beginning and farming and agriculture and production of food was the first professional occupation that you gave to humanity. Remind us of that. Lay your hands upon Gabe and his team and others like him to keep that story being told. That they, people may feel supportive 
when it seems so different and so strange from anything they've ever done before. Give them a courage that they didn't know they possessed to step forward and to connect with you in the land, to restore soil biology, to restore ecosystems that we can't see and are more vast than the universe. Lord, be with Gabe tonight. Lay your spirit upon him. Guide his words. Guide his insight. And may we as listeners learn something new tonight that we never knew before, that we know how we're to go forward and join in this journey of soil health, resilience, and support of American and international agriculture. Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, again, uh, just to uh, kind of uh, support what Lindsay had put into the um, previously, if you've got a question, go to Q&A, uh, type it in, and uh, by the end of the night, we will have Gabe respond to all of your questions. So please, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Gabe, we saw you last November. A lot of things have happened weather-wise, especially here in the upper Midwest, but all parts of of the United States. Uh, we've had a warm and normal winter. We've had uh, a very warm March. And then suddenly it began to rain. And then in June, a lot of this upper Midwest was underwater. Um, so the question I have uh, and the question tonight is, can the use of regenerative agriculture, a focus of resiliency in, in our soil management, is there a way that this can help mitigate some of the impact of extreme weather? Short answer is absolutely yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, we're done, huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. So really a pleasure to be with you this evening and, and to talk about how we can use regenerative ag to reduce the impact of extreme weather. And uh, I put this photo up there. This is actually a photo that my son took from our ranch in 1998, the, uh, which was uh, the evening that we lost 80% of our crop to hail. And that was the uh, the thunderstorm and hailstorm that produced that. And uh, I'm not going to say that we can uh, mitigate the effects of hailstorms, but we can certainly build up resiliency so that one can bounce back much quicker. You know, just uh, over the weekend, I was in New York City doing an event for the Ford Foundation talking about the crisis and the challenges in uh, rural America. And when I'm on the coast often, they're talking a lot about climate change. And I try and educate them that what climate change really is, is we're seeing the result of degradation. And I, I wanna make this clear, I'm not saying that this degradation is entirely due to farming and ranching practices because there's many other things that go into it, such as um, industry uh, emissions, uh, just emissions from our uh, vehicles, et cetera, just uh, manufacturing processes, et cetera, uh, many things. But I think as farmers, ranchers, gardeners, landowners, operators, we have to accept the fact that we are partially responsible for this degradation. Uh, this is, you'll have to excuse this photo. It was taken out of the sitting in the, in the vehicle, but I think it drives home the point. Um, often in agriculture, we're using practices that degrade the resource. This particular photo, of course, is a farmer out seeding in the spring. And you can see the soil that's moving from that. And I'll, I'll talk coming up here about, you might think that's not much soil, but I'll give an illustration coming up here that shows 
just how many tons of topsoil are being lost with a simple event such as this. And then we take into account the fact that oftentimes we're using repeated tillage passes. And for those homeowners who have a garden, uh, I'll even challenge them, if they're tilling their garden, they are uh, accelerating climate change because they're putting carbon from that soil in your garden up into the atmosphere also. So we can't let that go unaddressed either. And this is what tillage leads to. This is a photo one of our team members took in Kansas. And obviously that field had been tilled repeatedly, but just take a look at that soil and let it really sink in in your mind. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the ramifications of that. This is the ramification along the, the road ditch. And um, Tim, it was great to hear you talk about uh, the uh, workshop there, the, the hearing session with the uh, house members and Mark Gutierrez and the team at the Minnesota Health uh, Coalition are doing some great work in helping to stop this from happening in Minnesota because as we know, oftentimes in Minnesota, especially in areas of the state where uh, tillage is prevalent in the winter, you'll see that soil in the road ditches and on the road. And, and we need to stop that. Every time we do tillage, we're putting massive amounts of carbon back into the atmosphere. And here's another photo. This is of a sunflower field that was uh, uh, had been tilled, sunflowers planted, sunflowers harvested. But I want us to think about the negative ramifications of this, not only on the soil itself, but how about to the soil microbiology? And I'll talk about water infiltration also. We stuck a spade in that soil there. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is look at the crust on that soil. Just like if we cut our skin, we get a scab forming to protect the flesh underneath. Well, that's what the soil's doing here. When we till the soil, that crust is forming to protect that biology underneath. However, it's it's not a good thing, as I'll show you. Just another another view of it here, how that soil, once we till, doesn't matter whether we're talking in an agricultural field in a garden, in a, in a public uh, park, any type of landscape, once we till that soil, we're severely degrading that resource. This is the temperature we took off that soil, over 146 degrees. And one of the things I do and our team does when we go out on farms and ranches, we carry these thermometers with us. And we show the temperature differences on bare soil. And people might think, oh, 146 degrees, that's very hot, of course, but so what? Well, take a look at this. When soil temperatures are 70 degrees, 100% of that moisture that's in the soil can be used for plant growth. Now, what are we in the business of doing? Whether we're farmers, ranchers, gardeners, we're in the business of growing things, right? So why wouldn't we want optimum soil temperatures in order to have optimum growth of our plants? Now, as soil temperatures rise to even 100 degrees, only 15% of that moisture is, is available for the plant. 85% of it is lost to evaporation and transpiration in the top uh, several inches of that soil profile, okay? Now, as we move to 130 degrees, that soil really starts to shut down. 100% of the moisture is lost in that topsoil. And then at 140 plus degrees, we're negatively impacting soil biology. And this is extremely important, and I'm gonna talk more in depth about this a little later in the presentation because it's that soil biology that not only provides the nutrients that our plants need for growth, 
but it brings the nutrients to the plants that we need for our health. And so soil biology is directly related to our health. And we need to realize that soil biology lives in and on thin films of water in the pore spaces between the soil aggregates. So if we have the temperature rising in the soil, we're gonna negatively affect soil biology. We're gonna actually kill soil biology if the soil temps reach high enough. And that will negatively affect what we're producing. So gardeners out there, if you're tilling your soil and not leaving it covered, you're actually negatively affecting the nutrient density of the vegetables or uh, other garden produce that, that you're growing. I really like this example here. And these photos were taken from a, on the left, a forested area. A farmer had a forested area. They cleared part of that forested area and they, they tilled it and farmed it monoculture soybeans for 17 years. So that's the soil you see on the right. So you don't think, if you, if you don't believe mankind's actions, and as I like to call it, our stewardship, some prefer to call it management, can either negatively or positively affect soil, take a look at this photo. That's the exact same soil, just 17 years, of tillage and quote unquote conventional agricultural practices. By that, I mean uh, synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides. And I do not want to uh, give people the impression that it's tillage alone that causes these negative ramifications. Certainly the fertilizers, chemicals, pesticides and that play a significant role also. I want to make that clear. But this soil started out 4.3% organic matter when it, when it was in a forest, and it went down to 1.7% organic matter after being farmed for 17 years. Now, what I just put up there is under a microscope, and it's plain to see the difference in that soil aggregation uh, under the forest and then after it had been tilled. Remember what I just said about biology living in and on thin films of water in the pore spaces, okay? Which of these soils is gonna infiltrate water faster, okay? Which is gonna have the home for biology? Which of course has higher carbon content? It's plain to see uh, uh, under that microscopic view and we see this over and over in agricultural soils as we travel and work around the world. This, I'll play this a minute and then I'll, I'll stop it. So this is a, a video of a dust storm soil blowing in Texas, you can see in April of 2016. And how sad it is that we have that occurring today. Many of you will remember just uh, two years ago, the incidents of uh, the deaths in Illinois from uh, on the highway where people couldn't see and there was terrible uh, accident involving many vehicles and several deaths. Here's another one that this photo really illustrates. And we think of, uh, uh, the Dust Bowl, the lower right-hand corner, this took place in Colorado, which is where the Dust Bowl first started to form. You can see in the lower right, April 14th, 1935. Now look, same location, January 12th, 2014. What do you notice about those two pictures that's so obvious? This is same, same county in Colorado. Notice the difference in color of the soil. First of all, it's absolutely appalling to me that, that you know, 79 years passed and we really haven't learned anything because the same degradation is occurring. But notice the difference in the color of the soil. You can tell how much carbon has been lost in those 79 years by how light 
colored that soil is that's blowing there in 2014. That's pretty amazing. And we're seeing that today all over the country. So Tim talked about that we've been very wet uh, in the Northern Plains here for part of uh, this summer. But in many areas of the country, there's the opposite effect. There's actually drought going on. Uh, when we've been working with uh, ranchers in the Southwest, farmers that are experiencing severe drought. And if you think back to the photo I just showed under the microscope there and how tillage collapses soil structure, is that not causing drought? I've found it interesting that, that uh, these statistics on soil loss estimate. So worldwide, it's estimated that we lose between 2.2 and 11.4 tons of topsoil per acre per year. That's pretty appalling that we think that that's okay. Uh, you know, we can't do that. Our team travels extensively and we're now actively consulting on over 35 million acres of land. And we see over and over again that 30 to 75 percent of the carbon that was once in our arable soils is now in the atmosphere. And we wonder why we have so much carbon in the atmosphere, so much CO2. We need to take that back out of the atmosphere and put it back in the soil cycle where it belongs. We're seeing desertification at an alarming rate. Now, I really enjoy reading the Bible. And when you read the Bible, you begin to understand that it gives us great historical context of what the earth looked like uh, shortly before and after the, the birth of Christ. What we're seeing is that the, there were not deserts on the earth like we have them today. The deserts that we have on the earth today are the direct result of mankind's action. You see, as we overgraze, as we use excessive inputs, as we use tillage improperly, we have a loss of green. That loss of green then causes there to be less rain, Less rain then causes even less green. Less green causes even less rain. And we have desertification. I was uh, speaking at a workshop in New Mexico uh, a few years back. And I was given some historical ecological context of that area of New Mexico. And I was telling the participants in the audience that day that that area of New Mexico was not a desert. It was a vast grassland. And several of them called me out on it. And then a gentleman stood up in the audience and he said, no, no, stop it. I have the diary from my great grandmother who wrote out from El Paso. And in her diary, she talked about they rode for three days and the grass never dropped below the height of the saddle on the horse. And boy, the audience then, they became quiet and took notice. But think of what I just have on the screen here and what happened since that gentleman's great grandmother drove, uh, rode out onto those prairies was overgrazing. You know, it was overgrazed by Spaniards with sheep starting out and then uh, by cattle. And uh, that overgrazing caused desertification, just like our farming practices can cause desertification. Another challenge we have then is, is simply poor soil function. Here's a rainfall event and, and obviously the rain is not able to infiltrate 
into the soil and it runs off, causing erosion and taking with the causing flooding downstream. Uh, this negatively impacts, you know, towns, cities, watersheds uh, in that in that watershed. Uh, we see this over and over. Now think of the landscape and uh, no matter where you're at, but think of how it's changed. You know, I'm getting on in years and I can remember as a child, we would uh, go duck hunting in the fall of the year. And there was plenty of these seasonal wetlands where we could, uh, we could hunt ducks. What have we done in farming and ranching? We've drained those seasonal wetlands. Uh, we've put in tile drainage. Uh, we've eliminated the ability of our soil to infiltrate water. And what does this do? This causes negative consequences downstream. Uh, this is here in my home state of North Dakota, Fargo, North Dakota. The flooding along the Red River Valley is, is most years it happens. And it's because of a disrupted water cycle. That soil then ends up in our watersheds. My friend Ray Archuleta took this photo out of an airplane. But look at the color of that, that water. You can tell the amount of sediment and soil that's in it. Now, unfortunately, it's not only soil that's going into those watershed, it's the nutrients and chemicals along with it. This photo is actually a satellite imagery of in British Columbia, where the river flows into the uh, near Vancouver, north of Vancouver. And look at the amount of soil that's being moved down that watershed and put into uh, the Pacific Ocean. It, it's absolutely appalling. Now, when you think of the amount of nitrates and phosphates and chemicals that are in it, you know, unfortunately, here in the United States, the, the last hundred miles before the Mississippi um, goes into the Gulf of Mexico is known as Cancer Alley because it's the highest incident rates of cancer in the United States. And we cannot, as farmers and ranchers, ignore the fact that we're partially to blame for that. However, I'm going to say tonight that it's not only farmers and ranchers, the consumers are also partially to, to blame because they have demanded this type of a farming model, one that is based on copious amounts of low cost food at the expense of our natural ecosystems. The other challenge we have is we're, we're draining the wealth from rural America and our community, rural communities often are drying up. The money is being exported from them. The lack of soil function, the lack of the ability to grow crops profitably without significant inputs is negatively affecting profitability, thus negatively affecting our rural communities. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit tonight about the human health crisis that's going on. And no matter where I travel, the incidences of ADD, ADHD, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autoimmune diseases, cancer, osteoporosis, we can go on and on, are increasing at an alarming rate. And I contend that, and many others do also, that this is at least in part due to the fact that we no longer have the nutrient density in our foods that we once have. And that's a direct result of the lack of soil function. I'm gonna talk about that. 95% of the food we uh, production depends on the soil. If the average depth of soil globally is three feet, which it's not, but if the average depth was, human society relies on the equivalent of the thickness of a sheet of paper 
on top of 2.35 Eiffel Towers. So think about that. You know, our life depends on the thickness of a sheet of paper, essentially. We need to, we need to contemplate that for a moment. So how can we mitigate this and reverse this? We can do it by using and practicing regenerative agriculture. We like to think of regenerative agriculture as common ground for common good. I was talking to, to Tim before we went on here, and I was telling him, you know, I firmly believe that as humans, we can agree on 85 to 90% of the issues. Okay, why don't we come together and work on the things that we agree on and just that other 10 to 15 percent will work itself out. Let's come together and find common ground for common good. And I truly believe that common ground starts with regenerative agriculture. Here is a definition of regenerative agriculture that we like to use. It's farming and ranching in synchrony, and I will change this here, with God's creation to repair, rebuild, restore, and revitalize ecosystem function, starting with all life in the soil and expanding to all life above the soil. This is an all-encompassing definition that I think we can all rally around. So what we're doing in regenerative agriculture is we're restoring ecosystem function. And there's four ecosystem processes that occur everywhere in the world where there's land-based agriculture. They are briefly the energy cycle. And we all learned about this. It's sunshine, photosynthesis occurs, a plant uses part of those carbon compounds for growth, a portion of them are translocated to the roots where they're exuded into the soil in order to feed biology. And that biology, by feeding on those carbon compounds and running its life cycle, feeds the plants. And I'm going to talk more about that. It's also the biology interacting with the plants, mycorrhizal fungi, that starts binding those sand, silt, and clay particles together to form those soil aggregates that drive the water cycle infiltration. And the fourth uh, ecosystem process is that of biodiversity as the picture shows there. Where in nature do you find a monoculture? You don't, nature abhors a monoculture. It only is where mankind's actions have caused it to occur. Nature thrives on biodiversity because it wants as much diversity of plants, animals, insects possible. Now to enhance those four ecosystem processes, we know uh, we practice what's become known as the six principles of soil health. And briefly, number one, you have to know your context. I, I live in North Dakota. I tell people it is for years, I ranched out of context in North Dakota when I was calving in February in North Dakota. That makes no sense. That's out of context. Now we calve in late May and June. No health problems with the calves. They, the cows calve out on, on lush green grass. The calves are happy. That's in my context. Second principle is least amount of disturbance. By that, I mean fertilizers, chemicals, pesticides, tillage. Those are all disturbances. Where in nature do you find tillage? Yeah, there's rodents and other burrowing animals that'll till the soil. Earthworms will move the soil, but not leaving the soil bare like the pictures that I showed you. The third principle is cover and build surface armor. We should not see bare soil. We need to keep that covered as I showed you to protect that soil from wind erosion, water erosion, evaporation. We need diversity. You know, it's sad nowadays. I can drive for hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, and only see a corn or a soybean crop. Where's the diversity? How are we capturing solar energy when that cash crop is not growing? 
I'm not saying we can't have a monoculture crop, but we need to have diversity along with it, either before that cash crop, along with the cash crop, or after it. And we need diversity of animals and insects. The fifth principle is keep living roots in the soil as long as possible throughout the year. You know, here we are in mid-August. Uh, I flew into Minneapolis from New York on Tuesday late afternoon and then from Minneapolis home to Bismarck and there's a lot of harvesting of spring wheat, oats, barley going on. Yet I didn't see a single person out there with a drill planting a cover crop. Yet there's plenty of time to grow a cover crop, capture that solar energy and convert it into food for biology and taking carbon back out of the atmosphere. We need to have living roots as long as possible in our soil. And the sixth principle is we need animal and insect integration. Land-based ecosystems do not function properly without animals and insects, plain and simple. There was just a, uh, a study that was done in Germany showing 75% loss of insect biodiversity in the past 25 years. That's appalling. We have to reverse that. Remember, for every insect species that's a pest, there's 1,700 that are beneficial or indifferent. Why do we want to focus on killing that one pest? Let's provide the home and habitat for all the others. So here's how we do that. Here's what that looks like, putting these principles into practices. Here's minimal disturbance. This is a farmer who grew a cover crop of cereal rye, and now there are no-till planting vegetables in it. Very easy to do in your garden. This is a producer in North Dakota. That is a cover crop of cereal rye and they're actually no-tilling their cash crop right into it. As soon as they're done seeding this cash crop, they'll go in and terminate this cover crop, either with rolling or a herbicide. This is what uh, it looks like. Here's a corn crop that was seeded into a rolled down cover crop. Look at how well that soil is protected. You know, it's not gonna be prone to wind erosion, water erosion or evaporation. Here's diversity. This is actually taken on, on my ranch. This is a combination of four different cash crops growing together. We seed them, grow them together, harvest them together, and use them as livestock feed. Works fantastic, much better than the monoculture. This is living root as long as possible throughout the year. And I want you to look at this. I know your eyes tend to gravitate to the flower, but just look at all the different plant species in that picture. And the fact of the matter is, that's how our native prairie ecosystems were at one time. If you read Lewis and Clark's old journals, they documented well over 300 different species of plants growing on the prairies. Yet, why, we don't certainly don't have anywhere close to that today. And then the final principle is that of animal integration. Uh, this is a group of grass finishers grazing a cover crop. And that cover crop is the second crop that was uh, grown in that particular field that year. But what we're seeing is we can advance soil health significantly in a cash grain farm, but we'll never get that soil health to the level it could be if we don't integrate animals. Animals are critical to taking carbon out of the atmosphere. There's some great work being done right now by a team of scientists, and they have shown that using adaptive grazing methods, we can sequester 12.1 tons CO2 equivalent per hectare per year using adaptive grazing. If we simply turn the animals out onto uh, pasture set stock season long, only 2.9 tons. So over four times more carbon we can pull out of the atmosphere 
with adaptively grazing animals, integrating them into the system. We grow diversity and we grow life. That, that's what it's about. We need diversity of all kinds, animals and insects. This is a photo I took off of uh, the front porch of my house, June 15, 2009. They were calling for a major rainfall event and realized we only get between 10 and 12 inches of rainfall per year. It started raining at about uh, 6.30 in the evening. By midnight, we had had over 12 inches. We ended up with 13.6 inches in 22 hours. Now, this is an actual photo that Jay Fear, the district conservationist with Burley County NRCS, took the next morning uh, on my ranch. And I'm a little embarrassed. There's a few bare spots there, but that doesn't look too bad for 13.6 inches of rain in 22 hours. So where did the rain go? Did it run off? No, it infiltrated into the soil. This is a neighbor, okay? And you can see this neighbor's photo, though, was taken out after only a half of an inch of rain had fallen. Look, look at the difference there, okay? They can only infiltrate a half of an inch of rain per hour. These are their two soils. The soil head in the foreground is from my neighbor's farm just across the fence. The soil in the background is from our farm, cropland, just feet away. And I put this up there not to criticize my neighbor, but to show the difference that steward management, or as I prefer to call it, stewardship makes. You see, when my wife and I bought our ranch from her parents in 1993, we could only infiltrate a half of an inch per hour, which is what my neighbors can infiltrate today. Now today, using very scientific methods, scientists have shown we can now infiltrate 32 inches per hour. Bismarck, North Dakota has never ever recorded 30 inches of rain in a year, let alone an hour. Organic matter levels, my neighbors are at 1.7%. We were at 1.7 to 1.9 when we purchased the ranch. Today, that, that photo there, that soil tests 9.4% organic matter. So think of how this plays into the theme of this webinar. How do we make ourselves resilient to these extremes in weather? Now, another thing I would just I would just say to you is. Uh, Bismarck, North Dakota, the years uh, 2020, 2021, 2022 were the three driest years in recorded weather history in Bismarck. Uh, we had less than six and a half inches approximately of moisture total any of those three years. My son harvested a crop every year. Now, I'm not going to say it was a bumper crop, but it was a profitable crop. He made money every year. All of our neighbors harvested crops one out of the three years. Why is that? It's because our soils are resilient. We can hold much more water. You see, for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, and the soil organic matter is approximately 58% carbon, the soil can hold an additional 20,000 gallons of water per acre per foot of the soil profile. So think of that. I'm missing a zero there. Sorry about that. Just noticed 20,000 gallons of water. So think of that. If we have a four foot soil profile, that's another 80,000 gallons of water per acre that we can hold in our soils. That's significant. This is a close-up of our soil and what it looks like. Look at the aggregation there. Think of how a new seedling, when it germinates, will be able to go down, that root will be able to go down through that soil to access nutrients and water. Now, the other reason that aggregation I just showed you is so important 
I mentioned earlier that biology lives in and on thin films of water in the pore spaces, okay? This biology is crucial to human health. And I use this picture here of these two eggs to emphasize that point. Which of these two eggs will be the highest in nutrient density? Which will be the highest in a flavor profile? It's pretty obvious to see the egg on the right. Well, we're actually working with a team of scientists now that is proving that out. This is Dr. Stefan Van Vliet, Utah State University. That's a mass spectrometer there. Dr. Van Vliet can identify over 2,300 phytonutrient compounds. So what we're helping him do, we're identifying farms and ranches that are going down the regenerative path improving their soil health, their resiliency. And then we're identifying neighboring farms that have not started down the path yet. We're going on to those farms, growing the same fruit, vegetable, grain, pastured protein, whatever the case may be. Dr. Van Vliet and his team of scientists are looking at soil microbiology, identifying that biology and the diversity therein. They're looking at the diversity of plant species, animals, insects, then using a mass spectrometer, they are uh, identifying those phytonutrient compounds. Here's what they're finding. This is just a uh, small taste of the data that they're finding. Vitamins, 25 to 64% higher from the food grown on regenerative farms. Fatty acid profiles, which is the good thing, the CLAs, et cetera, uh, 32 to 239% higher. Oxidative stress markers, that indicates uh, for heart attacks, et cetera. You want it lower, 28 to 67% lower. It's absolutely amazing what we're finding Farm after farm after farm that's going down the regenerative path is producing food that is higher in nutrient density. You see, regenerative agriculture really is common ground for common good. By, ado by adopting these regenerative practices, using them, and by consumers seeking out farmers, ranchers who are uh, using these practices and then buying food from them, we can address climate issues. We can address water quality issues, air quality issues. We can certainly increase nutrient density of food, thus improving human health. We can increase biodiversity and ecosystem function. We can significantly reduce or eliminate the amount of synthetic fertilizers and pesti pesticides. We can increase on-farm profit leading to improved communities, and we can certainly have humane conditions for animals. If you want to learn more, I'll put a plug in for my book, Dirt to Soil, and I'm always happy to answer any questions. With that, Tim, do we have time for some questions? We certainly do. Uh, you know, Gabe, I've seen several of your webinars You've been kind to share your your wisdom and insight to learning with EEN. And every time you do this, I learn a new thing. So I appreciate that. So what kind of questions? I see there's just one question so far. Um, so please uh, leave questions for Gabe. Something you don't understand. You want more clarification. Oh, here they come. Uh, what approach works best to engage with supermarkets who are demanding intensive monocultures from farming, how can they be persuaded to do otherwise? Yeah, great question. And, and it all starts with demand. Do these supermarkets know that you truly want them to provide regeneratively grown and raised products? And that's where it starts. You have to... Uh, voice that to them every time you go in there. You have to let them know that you want that. And 
it's a matter of simply, uh, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And how we're going to change this production model is through consumer demand. Good question. Uh, kind of a piggyback question uh, of my own is, you know, we're hearing a lot of talk about how expensive food is. Mm -hmm. That the costs are going up. Uh, it's become part of our political chatter and narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, are we going to expect to pay more for our food uh, as we move mm -hmm. to a more regenerative model? Yeah. And and here's the, here's the little secret. So I honestly believe that the majority of food being produced today is overpriced because it lacks nutrient density. But if we are able, which we've shown, Dr. Van Vliet and his team are showing that significantly higher nutrient density in food grown in and on healthy soils, <clears throat> what's that worth from a human health standpoint. There is some really good work that's being done on Oklahoma right now. They uh, are doing some trials where they took um, individuals who were on the women, infant and children's program for food stamps. I'll, I'll just say that term loosely, but they, they took one subset and allowed them to purchase their food anywhere. They took another subset and had them use uh, that to purchase food, regeneratively grown and raised, farmers markets, etc. The very first year, a 20% reduction in healthcare costs from the subset of, of, of individuals purchasing regeneratively grown and raised food. Now, tie this back into healthcare. How much do we spend on healthcare costs? What's it worth if we can reduce healthcare costs 20, 30, 40, 50%, right? Now, I will tell you this though, in all honesty, we're able to produce food at a lower price point using regenerative practices <laughs> because we don't need all those uh, expensive inputs. So not only is it good for the ecosystem, good for nutrient density, but we can do it actually at a lower price point. Now, right now, Tim, of course, it's supply and demand. There's not enough regenerative farmers out there. Uh, demand far outweighs supply at this point in time. Another question, Gabe. Uh, the question is, with 11 inches of precipitation per year, how can cover crops be grown, especially when water is necessary for our cash crops? Oh. Great question. So here's how I answer that. That individual who asked that needs to do a water infiltration test. And I'm willing to bet right now they probably cannot infiltrate over a half of an inch per hour. So my point being, how often do they get more than a half an inch an hour of rainfall? They can't infiltrate what's occurring anyway. It's running off and they're losing it. It's like Dr. Dwayne Beck said, if you have too much water, you need to plant cover crops to use some of that moisture. But if you don't have, if you're in an arid environment, dry, then you need to plant cover crops even more because you need to grow that soil aggregation, like I showed you in the pictures, and increase the carbon levels of your soil so you can infiltrate more water and hold on to it. It's a misnomer that cover crops, of course they use moisture, they're a growing plant, but it's a misnomer that you have a negative effect from it. It'll be positive long-term. So a question from another uh, listener is, what Gabe has proposed is fantastic. It makes sense. How can we convince more farmers to make the shift? Yeah, and I wish I could wave the magic wand and get that to happen. <laughs> Realize farmers and ranchers cannot implement what they do not know. And I tell people this, I have two college degrees in agriculture. My son has three. 
Never, ever, not once in any of our years of study did they talk to us about the four ecosystem processes, the six principles of soil health. When we go out and educate farmers and ranchers and show them, you know, some great work by Dr. John Lundgren that shows regenerative farms and ranches, 78% greater profitability, okay? When we show that to farmers on their fields and they see it with their own eyes, they see the water infiltrating, they see the life return into the soil, they see they're able to start cutting back on inputs, then you're able to uh, get them to adopt these practices. Yeah, Gabe, you and I are, are probably contemporaries. Long ago at the University of Minnesota, I took a soil science class. We talked about soil structure and soil chemistry. There was yes. never any discussion about soil biology. That's right. So, so I'm excited about what I'm hearing. Yeah. A, a question uh, a um, listener asks, what cash crops do you grow successfully on your farm, Gabe? Yeah, so... Uh, seven years ago, my wife and I turned the ranch over to our son. He and his wife operate it now, but they grow corn, spring wheat, oats, barley, peas, cereal rye, winter triticale, hairy vetch, uh, forage crops. But those are the main cash crops, what I listed there. Okay. This person asks, as a consumer, where and how can I find food produced via regenerative agriculture? I have found purchased meat from regenerative farms online. However, fruits and vegetables from regenerative farms seem more challenging to find. Yep. And I'm happy to say we are seeing major movement. Whole Foods now in the U.S. has... Uh, made a major commitment to regenerative products as have a number of other supermarkets. And um, you, it's gonna become more and more prevalent. For the time being though, I agree with you, it is a bit difficult. You have to uh, do your homework, but there are many food co-ops and uh, a grocery chains such as Whole Foods that are starting to offer regeneratively grown and raised products. So again, Gabe, it goes back to the greasy wheel concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you ask now, for- I will add to that, and I'm not saying this as a plug for my team and I, but several years ago, we saw that there's a lot of greenwashing going on where companies and farms are saying they're regenerative, we started a company called Regenified, and that is a made up word. And Regenified's goal was to verify the good work that farms and ranches are doing going down this regenerative path and the commitment that they've made to regenerative agriculture. And they are certifying, Regenified is certifying these farms and ranches and then lining them up with supply chains that want to source those regeneratively grown and raised products. And so you can actually, there are regenified products uh, starting to show up on, on store shelves right now. Uh, observation being made here, Gabe, perhaps we should adopt composting instead of failing at cover crops. Uh, the, the, okay, composting is good if it is good compost. However, uh, quite honestly, about 80 plus percent of the compost that we see will actually do more harm than good. It is improperly uh, produced and can actually be negative to soil biology. So you have to be really careful, know how to produce that compost. I encourage everyone to look up the Johnson Sue composting method because it'll proliferate the uh, right type of biology, the fungal component, the predators, protozoa, etc. Johnson Sue method. But we're always proponents of good compost. Right. Also, Gabe, you uh, your son farms what five thousand acres? About six, yeah. That we that would be a volume of compost I couldn't imagine producing. To, to 
to meet the nutrient needs. Yeah. Well, you never could. You couldn't. There wouldn't be enough biomass. First of all, you have to have the biomass to produce the compost. The beautiful thing about Johnson Sioux, you can produce a small amount and use it as a seed inoculum. Yeah. The other issue, adding compost alone is not going to take carbon out of the atmosphere. We need living plants and photosynthesis to do that. So uh, um, we're talking two different things there. Okay. If there's interest in the Johnson Sioux, we could we could at some point include that as an upcoming webinar as well. Yeah. Uh, another question. Um, what are the four species of plants you grow in the mix you talked about that you feed your cattle? Yeah, and and not fed the cattle. We're we're 100% uh, grass fed and grass finished on our cattle and sheep. The the species that of uh, of crops that we feed to our hogs and our poultry are um, uh, peas, oats, barley, and flax. And then the picture that I showed you there was a mix of cereal rye, winter triticale, uh, forage winter wheat, and hairy vetch. And we also feed that combination to our hogs and poultry. Okay. Another uh, supermarket question. Did you engage personally with Weight Rose in the UK? If so, where did you get the contact? Yes, yes, I have. And uh, I'd be happy if uh, you want to reach out to me, Gabe at understandingag.com. You want to email me, I'd be happy to uh, uh, give you a contact there. Uh, questions to raise. What is the potential of perennial plants via the Land Institute in regenerative agriculture? Sure, of course, I'm a big fan of perennials. I think we need more perennials in the system. And uh, there's yeah. also, uh, besides the Land Institute and the work they've done with Kernza, there's Dr. Stephen Jones at the Bread Lab, and he's developed a, a perennial wheat uh, variety yeah, it's a combination of varieties called Salish Blue. We've been working with uh, some of those perennial varieties as well. Uh, the more perennials we can get in the system, the better off it is for soil health. And I, I'll have to put a plug in for my, my uh, alma mater. University of Minnesota has their Forever Green initiative as well, yep. where they're raising many, many crops uh, that are perennial. Um, do you think the U.S healthcare industry will ever embrace or even prescribe using food as medicine instead of drugs? <laughs> I'll tell you this story and it's kind of sad and disappointing, but uh, a number of years ago, I was lecturing, uh, giving a presentation and after dinner speech to a group of professionals from, well, it, it was in Illinois, I'll just put it that way. And, uh, I was talking about this using food as health and a gentleman stood up, identified himself as a doctor and his comment to me was, he says, but Gabe, you need to realize I make my living writing prescriptions and Gabe having the mouth he has, I fired back at him, but did you not also take an oath? Because it just bothered me. What have we come to when we think writing a prescription is better than preventative medicine? So to answer the question there is, yes, I really do believe that because we are being contacted all the time by healthcare professionals who see that something is wrong. You know, I have uh, my grandchildren now are, are nine and six, and I look at health problems they have and their classmates have. We never used to have the food allergies and the, you know, that, that are so prevalent today. And you know it comes about from, from the food, the processed food that's being eaten. I tell people that it's sad today that I, I really believe very, very few of us have tasted nutrient-dense food. Mm -hmm. we, we don't eat food anymore. We eat food-like substances, right? <laughs> Take a look at, I always use a tomato as an example. I only eat tomatoes when it's fresh out of a garden with healthy soil. Otherwise, you can't consider those tomatoes. 
they're just not they don't they don't taste good they're they're just there's no nutrients in them those aren't tomatoes you know we have to get back to using food as preventative medicine i would say the same thing about eggs and chickens no. same <laughs> identical thing yeah a question here is what is your preferred soil testing method to mm -hmm. assess the progress you're making with your regenerative management practices? Also, is a drill the only way to plant a cover crop? So the first one is what is your soil testing method? Yeah. So with our clients, uh, we soil is, is biological and you said it, Tim, they didn't talk about that when you're at the university of Minnesota, we have to, assess the biology in the soil. So the tests we use are the Haney test, H-A-N-E-Y, and a PLFA test, phospholipid fatty acid. We also do a TND test once. A TND test is total nutrient digestion. That's a soil core taken zero to 12 inch depth, which shows you both the organic and inorganic fraction of nutrients that are available. We've tested, uh, we're on over 35 million acres now. We've never found a single acre that's deficient in nutrients for profitable crop production, not one acre. Now, the thing is there, it's not deficient in the nutrient. What it's deficient is in is the biology that cycles that nutrient makes it available to the plant. So that's why we do the TND test to show the client, you have plenty of nutrients. Then we do the other tests to assess where they're at biologically, because we have to jumpstart the biology and I'll guarantee you, 99% of the soils have plenty of bacteria, but what they're lacking is the predators, the protozoa and nematodes, which feed on the bacteria and thus drive the uh, nutrient cycle. So we have to assess that biology to see where they're at. And then we use plant diversity, you know, including cash crops, cover crops, or in the case of perennial pastures, we use animal impact to drive the biology and make those nutrients available then. Now, the second part of the question, is a drill the only way? No, you can broadcast if you're in a wet enough environment, airplanes, Drones, I just had a long conversation uh, working with a drone company that is uh, is uh, really ramping up the capability of to use drones to seed cover crops. Many different tools can be used. What was the middle test again? There's the it's Haney PLFA, PLFA okay. fatty acid, and then the TND test. All right. Uh, Lindsay, did you did you uh, want in at this point? No, I think we're good. We have okay. time to answer some more questions. Okay. Very good. Um, let's see, uh, what is your cover crop cocktail mix for so soil soil aggregates? There we go, aggregates. Yep. Yep. And to is a means to increase water infiltration. Yep. And realize, uh, Dwayne Beck had the best answer. When it, when people would ask him that, he say he would tell them, I didn't pick your spouse, I'm not gonna pick your cover crop, okay? And I like that answer. The reason I, can, I refuse to give a specific, I have to know a lot more. Where are they located? What time of the year? When are they seeding this? What are their capabilities to seed? There's so many, what are their resource concerns? You know, there's so many different uh, uh, questions that need to be answered before I would recommend a mix. In saying that, to build soil aggregates, you need fibrous root systems, which come from forbs or grasses, okay? Forbs or grasses will, will um, build the most soil aggregates. Here's a question. Uh, this person is interested in, in photochemicals synthesized by crops. He says, I know of Stefan's work that regeneratively grown crops of higher content. Can you elaborate on this? On the phytochemicals or? 
Yeah, and and so uh, it's absolutely amazing when you study this. And plants have the ability to send out different root exudates to attract different biological microbiological species to cycle certain nutrients. And it's absolutely amazing. So what Dr. Van Vliet is finding is the diversity on a particular field or pasture directly impacts the diversity of microbiology, which then directly influences the diversity of these uh, nutrients being brought to the plant and then the phytonutrient compounds that are being produced in the plant. And the beautiful thing is what he's found is that'll carry through not only from the plant, but then to the animal consuming that plant. So mm. whether it's a dairy animal, it'll it'll go to the milk. You know, if it's a beef <clears throat> animal into the beef, uh, uh, it's absolutely amazing. Here's a question. You've been traveling a lot, uh, Gabe. Uh, how do you adapt your message to other continents? For example, Africa, where there's less technology used generally by farmers. Yep. And, and that's why I give Ray Archuleta credit. Ray Archuleta a number of years ago said, we've got to add a sixth principle. It has to be context. We have to work within the context of the farmer and rancher and their environment and their, their family context, their financial context. And I would say their faith context, okay? All of those need to be taken into account. So when we go into a country such as Africa, we're not going to be talking about buying cover crop seed and, and using that. No, we're going to look at what are the indigenous species there? How can we use those species in their context to help grow soil? Realize, though, all soil is simply sand, silt, clay, different fractions thereof held together by biotic glues. I tell people this isn't rocket science. It's very, very simple because all over the world, no matter where we go, land-based agriculture, it's sand, silt, and clay, different fractions thereof held together by biotic glues. So that's where you start. How do you start building the soil aggregates, building the home for biology, keep the armor on the surface? Doesn't matter whether we're talking with a small garden or whether we're talking you know, a thousand acres, doesn't matter. Here's a question on crop insurance. Mm -hmm. So how can we flip the script on crop insurance? What well, if a conventional farmer who buys fertilizer, insecticides and herbicides, that's the insurance for his crop. If a farm is certified regenerative, they qualify for government crop insurance. Would that be helpful in incentivizing farmers to go regenerative? Well, farmers, all of our, the majority of our clients do take part in crop insurance, okay? Now, now our team doesn't, but there's nothing saying you can't. But one of the goals we have, since we're on such vast acreage, is we have a tremendous amount of data, okay? The history of our clients and what they're doing. And what we're finding is our clients have mm -hmm. less uh, disasters, okay? There's less claims for crop insurance, okay? They're able to repay back their, their loans quicker because they have much more resiliency. So the way we're approaching this is look at automobile insurance. If you don't have any claims, you should pay less for that automobile insurance, correct? If you borrow money from a lending institution, you pay them back regularly, you should be able to borrow money at a lower interest rate, correct? We're building the database in order to drive that into the system. And we believe it's coming. We actually have a number of lending institutions. Matter of fact, today I was... I had a Zoom meeting with a fund who is willing to loan farmers money 
at a reduced rate if they're using regenerative practices. So it's coming. We're working on it. And and Congress is very interested in that concept. They should be. <laughs> here's a, here's something. Uh, what Tim said about his education is confirmed by my team at the Noble Foundation in Oklahoma, a team of seven to eight PhDs who have never been exposed to soil biology. I was astounded. Look to the American Grass-Fed Association also for certified grass-fed producers. Shockingly, our ranch is the only one in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and uh, just to let you know uh, who went in and trained the Noble Institute for regen as to regenerative practices. They hired our team. We put on significant training and trained their entire staff as to those regenerative practices. So hats off to you for being, being regenerative in Oklahoma there. Um, here's a question. This person's having trouble finding crop, or, or sorry, cover crop information for Washington State. Any names in Washington State that can be helpful? Yeah, I would give you, uh, not in Washington, just across the border uh, in Idaho, Brad McIntyre, just across the border there. He is uh, west of Boise, Brad McIntyre. What about rotating a year of corn, a year of soybeans, and then three years of management intensive grazing? Wouldn't alternating the grasses in for those three years using that method really help replace nutrients in those fields, allowing for larger harvest the next two years of a commodity crop? And of course, doing cover crops each fall that you do a crop? A absolutely, it would improve. What, what we're short of in most situation is not nutrients with the exception of carbon. We're carbon deficient in most of our cropland soils. So absolutely, that'd be a great, great system. Great to look at. Okay. You step in the right direction. So we're gonna we get another seven minutes, and then I think we will give closure around uh, around eight thirty. So we'll try to answer all the questions we can. Recently, a conventional farmer who's experimenting with regenerative practices in an old pasture posed this question: If there's too much weed pressure, which is the lesser of two evils? <laughs> a treatment of Roundup or tillage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's what I would say. Um, I would ask that person, what is a weed? Then I would ask them, you know, they'll say a weed's a plant on a place, but I have yet to find a plant species that our livestock will not consume. Okay. And even if they won't consume them, you have to, there's some really good books out there. Weeds, guardians of the soil, weeds and what they tell us if you have an issue with the so-called weed and i prefer to call them forbs they are there for a reason they're trying to treat a symptom that's there okay you need to find out the root cause chances are let them cycle just use the animals you can always increase stock density to trample that forb but it's there to address an issue. Usually it's compaction, something like that. Now, to answer the question, the lesser of two evils, tillage or glyphosate, I'm not going to, I'm not gonna bite on that one. Each person has to determine that for themselves. There's pros and cons of each. Here's a question. There seems to be an overlap between regenerative agriculture and permaculture. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the difference between the two? Yeah, and really there's not a lot of difference between the two. Permaculture can certainly be regenerative. Regenerative can be regenerative. Organic can be regenerative. I've seen conventional producers who are regenerative. I don't wanna get hung up on words. What I really want is everyone to move forward. I want everyone to start making a difference and move down ecosystem restoration. How would you approach your neighbor row crop farmer to allow you to graze cover crops in their follow or fallow year, or, or I'm sorry, in their follow season or fallow season? Yeah, yeah. And, and the way to do that is to uh, 
see if they're open to it. Probably start on a smaller area, but you need to do it right. They're going to talk about compaction and issues like that. Realize compaction is just a function of time. You leave the animals in any one place too long. But show them there, there's, there's some good data out there that shows that adding livestock will actually uh, increase nutrient cycling, benefit the soil. So I would uh, just start by talking to them and uh, then do your homework, show them the data and approach it. Oftentimes you, you're gonna have, probably have to pay them something in order to do that, but it's well worth it if it's a neighbor close to you. Thank you, Gabe and team. The change at Noble has been nothing short of miraculous. We were feeding Jim Johnson and Hugh Aljo books on soil health back in 2008. Hallelujah for this complete 180. My husband is there today. Tomorrow, auditing a class they're, off, they're going to offer on the economics of mm -hmm. regenerative practices. Whoa. And wow, such progress. Yeah. Yeah. And and they've been tremendous to work with Noble. And, and you know, there's... I know Noble now is working with Ranching for Profit, great, great organization in and of itself. There's a lot of good things happening in education right now. All right, so this will have to be the last question of the night. How would you deal with hemlock, which comes down irrigation ditches from neighbors who don't care? Cattle have died from this plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and that is... That's that's a real challenge. Have to start educating the neighbors. What we're finding is we actually have clients whose cattle can graze hemlock in small amounts. And so using adaptive grazing, you can oftentimes get by without those uh, uh, death losses, but you got to be careful of it. Uh, sometimes you have these poisonous plants. It's, it's a matter of... Uh, adapting around them. And it's unfortunate there are some people who just don't care. I wish I had a silver bullet for you, but ones like that, there is no silver bullet. Well, Gabe, another good night. Any any last uh, kind of in, words of insight or wisdom for us tonight? Well, I would just say this. Um, you know, I've been at this a long time and I have seen more change the past three years than I have the previous 27 combined. The, re you know, you can't pick up a farm publication, list right. new farm program being broadcast that doesn't talk about regenerative. And it's not only farming and ranching now, it's moving into the human health sector like we talked about, you know, just here locally, I just saw an eye doctor advertising for regenerative eye care, you know, and I'm like, hey, that's great. Let's, let's go all in, everybody. But um, we're seeing it in building materials. <laughs> we're seeing it everywhere. And it's really exciting because through regenerative agriculture, we truly can get back to taking care of God's creation and being good stewards of God's creation. And I think that should be the goal of all of us is how do we truly help earth become a kingdom of God? Hallelujah. Encourage everyone to check out uh, Gabe's website. Uh, I invite you, our, our uh, August issue of Regenerate, which is our EEN, uh, Faith and Agriculture uh, newsletter, just went out uh, three, four hours ago. So it's fresh off the press. And I think there's some interesting articles there this uh, go around. Uh, like to do is close us out with prayer and uh, wish everyone a good night. Let's let's pray. Lord, in the, in the voice of Gabe and in the voices of the questioners, we've heard your you talk to us and with us and through us. You've given us insight on how to care for this world of yours that you've given to us as a gift. Help us to be good stewards of that gift and how we care for the land, we care for our, our families, we care for our communities. And Lord, we're just praying for the time of regeneration of all of humanity, that we can gather around the table. 
we can share bread, food, life, and love with each other. And that all of us, regardless of where we live in this world, will know abundant life in all things. We pray for your blessing on Gabe and all who were part of this evening. And may all we do in our words and our deeds be a blessing to you and to your kingdom and to all of our neighbors. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Have a great night. September 19th, we're back here with uh, a young man named uh, Mitchell Hora out of uh, Washington County, Iowa. He's going to talk about carbon intensity scoring of cropland as a means of providing premium for those farmers who are trying to integrate good regenerative soil health, resilient soil health practices into their farm. So have a good night. Keep us in your prayers. We'll keep you in our prayers as well. And we will see you in a month. Thank you all. Thank you.